Hello Darklings! Today I wanted to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is uh, the evolution of horror monsters and how, I don't know, how much I love them and how much they reflect human psychology and whatnot. So one of the things that I always approach as one of the stereotypic staples of being a goth kid is my really intense love of horror movies and especially of the monsters within the horror movies. So usually when you think movie monsters, you might end up thinking Frankenstein, Dracula, Wolfman. You know, the big three. Uh, you know, mummies and nightmares, foggy nights, all kinds of fun things. So this book is called Universal Studios Monsters. So I got this for Christmas a couple of years ago, but this has really good pictures and coverage about a variety of horror films that Universal Studios did in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, well, even in the 20s, kind of showing off some of, like these are all from Dracula, some of the classic monsters that many people grew up with and kind of became a staple within the gothic subculture. Uh, I don't know who to blame for that. I don't know whether to blame Vampyra Mela Nermi, or to blame the Misfits for rediscovering her in the early 80s and bringing it to everyone's attention. I don't know if I should blame Peter Murphy of Bauhaus for using the Cabinet of Dr. Caligari promotional image as part of his band. So, who knows? It goes with the dark and spooky elements that's really present in the stereotypic gothic culture. And one of the things that I always thought was kind of fun about the gothic culture is to be a stereotype and to kind of go with the campy and the ridiculous because it's fun and very fitting to this moody type of uh, mentality that's really common with uh, the goth subculture. Anyway, so, you know, Universal dominated with their monsters for a long time. I could probably give a lecture several hours long on the Lemleys, on the evolution of makeup, on the custody dispute legal battles about the different monsters and the rights for Dracula and all of this. But up next is The Hammer Vault. So this was another book I got for Christmas a couple of years ago. So in the 50s, this little low-budget studio got a hold of enough money to start making some pictures. And one of the best things that they did was revamp some universal classics. Now, Hammer Studios was around until the early 70s. They were doing all kinds of really ridiculous films after a fashion, such as Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde, The Scars of Dracula, and When Dinosaurs, Dinosaurs Ruled the Earth. But probably their most recent contribution to the film world is the American adaptation of let me in as opposed to the Swedish version let the right one in. I like both versions for different reasons. Now Hammer was in Technicolor which was their big thing. They brought movie monsters back to life in a time where there was EC Comics. So you had Tales from the Crypt and you, the host the Crypt Keeper and uh, Forey J. Ackerman's famous monsters uh, magazine, which is written more or less for children, and you have this sudden resurgence of monsters being brought to the public's attention, especially children in the early 50s, which I am all for, despite the fact that there ended up being a lot of legal issues and a ban on most of those horror comics from the early 50s. But monsters have always been a staple in fringe culture and should always be remembered fondly and never forgotten, as far as I'm concerned. And I know this is kind of all over the place, but I'm a big fan of monsters and of some of the more ridiculous films that came out that had monsters. So this book is, I already showed it in my last video, it's a book on Roger Corman, King of the Bee Movie. For example, one of his known films in the 50s is Attack of the Crab Monsters, with these horribly done puppets on this incredibly low, low budget, 
But he's also known for things such as Little Shop of Horrors, which he made in two days and a night on virtually no budget, but then became a cult classic. He also helped finance lots of other independent films. Once he was no longer in the director's chair, he helped work as a producer and would get a lot of these DIY young filmmakers and give them a bit of pocket money and see what they could come up with. They'd have incredibly tight budgets and everything, but it would work really well. He helped fi finance cl classics like The Slumber Party Massacre, which is considered like the first truly feminist horror film and definitely has its shining moments within its script. And Roger Corman is definitely someone to not look over, especially because in addition to just monster monsters, there's also the human monsters to consider. Vincent Price ended up starring on a lot of his Poe films in the early 60s, such as Tomb of Legia, Pit in the Pendulum, um, and Mask of the Red Death, which is my favorite. Uh, there are plenty of actors who are staples as monsters. Boris Karloff, Christopher Lee, Peter Cushing, Lon Chaney Jr. and Sr., uh, Bela Lugosi, um, Dwight Fry. Um, you definitely have plenty of people that came in and out in Universal. And then you'd have Scream Queens that came much later, but they're not quite as much fun as far as I'm concerned. There's not quite as much good dialogue in that. Now this last one is a book I have had for a couple of years now, and I love looking through it all the time. And it's John Landis, Monsters in the Movies. And he's done a couple of horror movies, such as American Werewolf in London and Innocent Blood. But he, he kind of covers different common themes, whether it's the werewolf, whether it's the vampire, the mummy, the mad scientist, genetically engineered eight people, or just really creepy ghost children such as what you get in The Innocence, The Shining, and any number of other things, which is not exactly monsters in the classic sense that you think of. But then you also get things such as fairy tales that start to become really prevalent. And there's a sort of glamour in fairy tales, and this is from La Belle et la Bette from Jean Cocteau's 1946 masterpiece film. And there's all these different elements that are very prevalent not just in horror, but in fairy tales and very medieval type of movies that ends up sneaking into gothic culture. So as I've said on many of occasion, and I hope I can brainwash all of my subscribers and followers into watching, Labyrinth is one of my favorite films. And even though it's not what I would call a gothy film, there are certainly elements in it that are very goth friendly, such as a lot of the wardrobe that they gave to Jareth is really, really good with these really amazing detailed leather jackets with armor pieces attached to them and sequins and all this sort of rough and tumble decaying elegance thing that's also noticeable in the Dark Crystal. And this idea of fantasy and horror and then making it something that's very beautiful, that's kind of what appealed to me so much about the Gothic culture. Now even though this was a super hodgepodge idea. I hope you could kind of follow where I was going with this. And I'm curious, please leave a comment if there was something about a film or music that inspired you to become goth, if you are in fact goth, or have an inkling of whether or not you like it. Anyway, till next time, Darklings.